Come on in. Come in. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. I'm glad you could manage to look in before Christmas. I've had a thought. Since we were enjoying Narnia last time, let's get another of these down. The original, of course. Okay, have a seat. Um. Well, we're coming on um, towards Christmas. So I thought it might be fun to have one or two more Christmassy readings. And an obvious candidate uh, seemed to me at a moment in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe when Father Christmas arrives, which completely enchanted me as a child, even though I subsequently learned that it annoyed Tolkien. Tolkien, of course, thought that all the bits of a, a sub-creation, as he called it, ought to be in innerly consistent. And he didn't think you could have fawns and dryads on the one hand and Father Christmas on the other in the same story, because they came, as it were, from different kind of mythic resonances. But I think Lewis is right. They can exist in our imaginations together. And they can actually, as Michael Ward brilliantly showed in his book Planet Narnia, they can contribute to a, to a similar atmosphere. An atmosphere is a relationship between the tea that Mr Tumnus gives and the tea that, that Father Christmas gives. I welcomed Father Christmas, and I welcomed Father Christmas that seemed more in touch with the, the primal, jovial spirits, a word that would have been important to Lewis. You see in the spirit of Christmas in... Um, in Dickens A Christmas Carol, for instance, or in some of the pieces of Chesterton. Anyway, I thought it'd be fun to do. Speaking of Christmases, I've had a sort of early Christmas present. In that when I was doing a lecture in America, somebody came up. People often come up and give me things or ask me to sign books, but this is very entertained. I got this out of a sort of big piece of wrapping. and It's somebody who does knitting, and she had knitted, knitted me as the poet. I'm, I'm half tempted on some of my... Um, my expeditions to to America to sort of perhaps I can send this this little figure instead. Anyway, I think I think she's got the hair and the beard and the the waistcoat quite well. My wife was entertained anyway. Um, so that's why this figure is sitting here. But anyway, you may remember that the sudden and magical and entirely unexpected appearance of Father Christmas occurs at a really dramatic point in the story, a point of real danger, because Edmund has slipped quietly off, having previously been corrupted by the witch with her Turkish delight, and has tragically gone off, um, essentially to betray his family and the, the people who are giving hospitality to his family, Mr and Mrs Beaver. And they don't really know at what point he's slipped off, so they suddenly realise that any moment the witch may be upon them. So they have to get everything packed and going, and they, they set off... Um, and then at the, towards gloaming, the dusk, they, 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 they find a hiding place that's an old sort of hiding place of the beavers. And the last thing we heard in the chapter before was the witch saying, take the fastest sleigh. But there's a little detail which one only remembers later, which is she says to the dwarf, don't put the sleigh bells on, presumably because she wants a silent pursuit. Anyway, they're all in hiding and then they hear... They hear the last thing they were wanting to hear, but the thing they most fear, which is the sound of sleigh bells. And I'll take up the thread of the story from there. <clears throat> Lucy's just woken up. Uh, they were listening to a sound which was the very sound they'd all been thinking of and sometimes imagining they heard during their walk last night. It was the sound of jingling bells. Mr Beaver was out of the cave like a flash the moment he heard it. Perhaps you think, as Lucy thought for a moment, that this was a very silly thing to do. But it was really a very sensible one. He knew he could scramble to the top of the bank among the bushes and brambles without being seen, and he wanted above all things to see which way the witch's sledge went. The others all sat in the cave, waiting and wondering. They waited nearly five minutes. Then they heard something that frightened them very much. They heard voices. Oh, thought Lucy, he's, he's been seen. She's caught him. Great was their surprise when a little later they heard Mr Beaver's voice calling to them from just outside the cave. 
It's all right, he was shouting. Come out, Mrs Beaver. Come out, sons and daughters of Adam. It's all right, it isn't her. This was bad grammar, of course, but it's how beavers talk when they're excited. I mean, in Narnia, or in our world, they usually don't talk at all. So, Mrs Beaver and the children came bundling out of the cave, all blinking in the daylight and with earth all over them, and looking very frosty and unbrushed and uncombed, and with the sleep still in their eyes. Come on, cried Mr Beaver, who was almost dancing with delight. Come and see. This is a nasty knock for the witch. It looks as if her power is already crumbling. What do you mean, Mr Beaver, panted Peter, as they all scrambled up the steep bank of the valley together. Didn't I tell you, answered Mr Beaver, that she'd made it always winter and never Christmas, didn't I tell you? Well, just come and see. And then they were all at the top, <coughs> and they did see. It was a sledge, and it was reindeer with bells on their harness, but they were far bigger than the witch's reindeer, and they were not white but brown, and on the sledge sat a person whom everyone knew the moment they set eyes on him. He was a huge man in a bright red robe, bright as holly berries, with a hood that had fur inside it, and a great white beard that fell like a foamy waterfall over his chest. Everyone knew him, because though you see people of his sort only in Narnia, you see pictures of them and hear them talked about even in our world, the world on this side of the wardrobe door. But when you really see them in Narnia, it's rather different. <clears throat> Some of the pictures of Father Christmas in our world make him look only funny and jolly. But now that the children actually stood looking at him, they didn't find it quite like that. He was so big and so glad and so real that they all became quite still. They felt very glad, but also solemn. I've come at last, he said. She has kept me out for a long time, but I have got in at last. Aslan is on the move. The witch's magic is weakening. And Lucy felt running through her that deep shiver of gladness you only get when you are being solemn and still. And now, said Father Christmas, for your presence. There is a new and better sewing machine for you, Mrs Beaver. I'll drop it in your house as I pass. If you please, sir, said Mrs Beaver, making a curtsy, it's locked up. Locks and bolts make no difference to me, said Father Christmas. And as for you, Mr Beaver, when you get home, you'll find your dam finished and mended, and all the leaks stopped, and a new sluice gate fitted. Mr Beaver was so pleased that he opened his mouth very wide, and then found he couldn't say anything at all. Peter, Adam's son, said Father Christmas. Here, sir, said Peter. These are your presents, was the answer, and they are tools, not toys. The time to use them is perhaps near at hand. Bear them well. With these words, he handed to Peter a shield and a sword. The shield was the colour of silver, and across it there ramped a red lion, as bright as a ripe strawberry at the moment when you pick it. The hilt of the sword was of gold, and it had a sheath and a sword belt and everything it needed, and it was just the right size and weight for Peter to use. Peter was silent and solemn as he received these gifts, for he felt they were a very serious kind of present. Susan, Eve's daughter, said Father Christmas, these are for you, and he handed her a bow and a quiver full of arrows, and a little ivory horn. You must use the bow only in great need, he said, for I do not mean you to fight in the battle. It does not easily miss. But when you put this horn to your lips and blow it, then wherever you are, I think help of some kind will come to you. Last of all, he said, Lucy, Eve's daughter, and Lucy came forward. He gave her a little bottle of what looked like glass, but people said afterwards that it was made of diamond and a small dagger. In this bottle, he said, there is a cordial made of the juice of one of the fire flowers that grow in the mountains of the sun. If you or any of your friends is hurt, a few drops of this will restore them, and the dagger is to defend yourself at great need, for you also are not to be in the battle. Why, sir, said Lucy, I think, I, I don't know, but I think I could be brave enough. That is not the point, he said, but battles are ugly when women fight, and now, here he suddenly looked less grave, here is something for the moment for you all. And he brought out, I suppose from the big bag at his back, but nobody quite saw him do it, a large tray containing five cups and saucers, 
a bowl of lump sugar, a jug of cream and a great big teapot all sizzling and piping hot. Then he cried out, Merry Christmas, long live the true king, and cracked his whip, and he and the reindeer and the sledge and all were out of sight before anyone realised that they had started. Peter had just drawn his sword out of its sheath and was showing it to Mr Beaver when Mrs Beaver said, Now then, now then, don't stand talking there till the tea's got cold, just like men. Come and help us carry a tray down and we'll have, and we'll have breakfast. What a mercy I thought of bringing the bread knife. Uh, wonderful practicality from Mrs Beaver there. So it, it, it's so good in so many ways that the sense of the sort of reality of Father Christmas, the movement from the idea of solemnity and gladness going together, something Lewis felt very strongly about and felt they had in the Middle Ages and that we'd somehow lost. The movement from the high solemnity of the arming of Peter, who will later be Sir Peter Wolfsbane, with the sort of wonderful cosiness of the tray somehow, and there, there's all the sort of pot of English tea in the middle of Narnia. Uh, it's a wonderful, well, I mean, Tolkien thought it was a hodgepodge, but I'm not sure that it is a hodgepodge. I think it's, it's a cramming together, a series of disparate but equally good things, and it's the goodness, in my view, that ties them all together. Anyway, uh, I just thought it'd be nice before Christmas, since we're not ruled by a white witch and Christmas is coming to us here in England, uh, just to get this little this little episode in. Um, and of course, dramatically and ironically, it contrasts with the unfortunate time that Edmund is having, who thought he was going to have all the good things in the presents, but having betrayed the good itself, is now having a much more difficult time. But as you know, Things come out all right for him as well in the end, thanks to the golden goodness of Aslan. It gives me pleasure to revisit these books. I, I sometimes get in touch with my, my eight-year-old self when I do. Anyway, have a, have a really good Christmas. If, if I don't see you before, you may be able to pop in, but uh, otherwise enjoy the festive season. Cheers. <laughs>